Oh, don't mind me. Just having a quick talk with my business partner from the first episode. Alright, now it's time to go to the Shadowlands. Our first stop in the Shadowlands are the Pilgrims waiting for Karnas so that they can reach Moonrise Towers. Pity they will never get there. No. No. Before we summon Karnas, we kill all of the Pilgrims to make the next fight a lot easier. Once Khan has arrived, we actually won't fight him just yet, because that would just be suicide with our build. Instead, we use our Intimidate proficiency to convince him to stay on our side. <laughs> they called the weakest of your fuck in your name, Majesty. Glorious. We then follow him into the Harper ambush, where we also stay on his side. Which has two reasons. First is that I don't want anyone to survive this encounter so that I can immediately get the pixie blessing once the fighting is over. And by initially staying on Kana's side, we get XP for every death. And second reason is... My character is dumb and didn't realize the ambush. So if I would betray Kana's now, I would just die before I even get the chance to move. Anyway, with the help of the Harpers, we take down Karnas rather easily. Unfortunately, all the surviving Harpers run away once Karnas fell. Probably because I was invisible at the moment. Still, it's a shame. I would have loved to get the XP. Oh well. Now that Karnas is dead, we can free the Pixie and she rewards us with her blessing. Protection from the Shadow Curse. What more could a dingus want? With her blessing, we can now immediately travel to Moonrise Towers and go on to a quick shopping tour. Our first stop there is the bugbear, who we are going to prove to that we are a true warrior, which gives us a 15% discount to all his items. Want anything from my stash? You pay less than the rest. Once this is done, we buy the Fistbreaker helm from him. This helm gives us a plus one to our spell safe DC, which is the stat that we need for all our high level damage spells, because they are all spells that require our enemies to make a saving throw. And on top of that, it also gives us a plus one to our initiative. It's literally the perfect headgear for us, at least until we can acquire the hood of the weave in Act 3. Next, we go to the blood merchant Araj. She will give us the potion of everlasting vigor if we force Astarion to bite her. This potion will increase our strength by two permanently. Nothing that will affect our gameplay in a great manner, but having slightly better athletics and being able to carry a bit more stuff is always nice. And since we are playing solo anyway, there is no reason not to take this potion. Additionally, we buy the rope of exquisite focus for another plus one to our spell safety C. And last but not least, we buy the Bow of Awareness from Brower Moonglow to get another plus one to our initiative. Having finished our shopping tour in Moonrise Towers, we enter the throne room where Caderic Tom is holding a trial over our bloodlusty girlfriend Mintara. Night Warden Mintara, your crime is incompetence and your sentence is death. Oh well, it was nice while it lasted. Caderic proceeds to be overly dramatic as the goblins can't accept their fate. Try again. In the end, it falls onto us to clean up his mess, ordering us around. He will regret that. You yearn to flay him until he forgets himself. He could enjoy your cuts forever and a day. Upstairs, we speak to Zuel. She tells us about a relic that Caterick's advisor, Balthazar, was sent to retrieve. But they lost contact with him, so now we should go to the Tor Mausoleum and find him. But this has to wait. We have a more important mission to take care of first. With the help of the key to Balthazar's room that we got from Zuel, we are able to enter the room of Isabel, Caterick's lost daughter. Of course, unseen and very silent. Inside her room, we need to kill the Mimic standing at the bottom of her bed. Upon killing it, we get the Spine Shutter Amulet, 
having both the Spine Shutter Amulet and the Boots of Stormy Glamour, all our ranged attacks will now apply 4 turns of reparation to the target. Before we are going to leave Moonwise Towers though, we are going to rescue Mintara. Because we are such a nice person. And after successfully getting her out of Moonwise Towers, it's now finally time to go to Last Light Inn. Arriving at Last Light Inn, we meet Jahira, who doesn't seem to trust us all that much. Quite surprising, since we have shut a trustworthy face. Luckily, we can convince her that we are free of the Absolute's will and are on her side. She sets us free and we just acquired a bunch of meat shields for the final battle. Now that we are considered an ally to the Harpers, we can buy the Inca Dance stuff from their Quartermaster. This stuff gives us a plus one to our ranged spell attacks and the fireball ability, which will become very useful later on. Now that we acquired most of our gear for the second arc, it's time to take out the shadow creatures surrounding Last Light Inn. While fighting the shadow curse plants, you need to be a bit careful, since the small ones will explode on death and two explosions from them can easily kill you. But of course, the same goes also for their allies, and we can use that to our advantage. When fighting the Shadow Quest Champling Mount, he would normally be the only one to react to the minor illusion, since all his allies are ambushing and therefore won't react to the minor illusion. But you can simply cancel their ambush condition by using Shriek from Falar Lu, while being invisible. Once you got everyone to cancel their ambush condition, you can use Mana Illusion to group them all up and then hit them with Fireball, causing the Shadow Quest Needles to explode right next to their allies. And this pretty much already concludes the entire fight. Back at Moonwise Towers, we kill some isolated guards to create some corpses for our undead servants and then make our way into the prison once more to free the remaining prisoners. Honestly, I find it kinda ridiculous that you need two bombs to kill these stupid flying eyes. Anyway, we take out all the guards at the prison and by taking out the warden, we also get the spell crooks amulet. This amulet allows us to restore a used spell slot of any level once per long rest. Incredibly useful for any type of spellcaster. Now that there are no guards left to disturb us, we help the remaining prisoners to break out and bring them to Last Light Inn. Upon finishing this quest, we get to level 8 and take Nock, which we later need to open two doors inside the Tor Mausoleum. For our second spell, we take Conjure Minor Elemental. I know this summon doesn't necessarily fit the Necromancer team. Unfortunately, though, I need to summon to safely kill some of the boss enemies in Act 2. But don't worry, this is the only elemental summon I'm going to use and also only for the second act. The elemental I want from this spell is the Aesir. The Aesir has a decent damage output being able to deal damage with both its action and bonus action point. But the main reason why I want to summon is because of his 20 AC which makes him quite tanky, giving me more time to take down the enemy. For our feat, we take the ability improvement for a plus 2 on our intelligence. Everything? Speaking about bosses, it's now finally time to take on the three Torm siblings. Starting with Tisobal Torm, we use a poison cloud to start the battle and then just run away to lure him out of the distillery. While running away from him, we use our summons to kill the four zombies fighting alongside him. Taking out the four zombies was a bit more of a hassle than I would have liked it to be. But in the end, we took them all out and now it's just Tisobald left. Taking out Tisobald after you got him out of the distillery is very easy. Just move next to the big tree and since Tisobald is too big to get through the gap between these two roots, he will just sit behind this big root waiting for you to kill him. Pity we had to kill him. He seemed more lonely than cruel. Next we pay a visit to our doctor, using the back door to get behind him. 
While you are standing behind him, be careful not to step on any of these stairs or you will immediately trigger the combat. Before we start the fight, we drink an invisibility potion to get the surprise attack and an elixir of blood loss. Additionally, we throw a speed potion behind us that we are going to pick up once the fight started. We again use the poison cloud to start the fight. Using the poison cloud to start the combat gives us the advantage that all the enemies take at least two turns of damage from the poison cloud due to the surprise attack. But more importantly, using the AoE spell causes the patient to immediately die, which will trigger our blood elixir, essentially giving us a free action point for the first round. One thing I quickly would like to add here is how legendary actions work. I noticed that many believe that the legendary actions won't trigger when the enemy is surprised, because there are reactions. And yes, it's true, most legendary actions are reactions, but they are not normal reactions. And that's why they will still trigger even if you surprise the enemy. As you can see here, Marlos and his sisters are all surprised and yet he still triggers his legendary ability when I attack him. Alright, back to the fight. With our main character, we are going to focus all of our attacks onto Marlos and ignore his sisters. Since our zombies are immune to poison damage, we can send them into the poison cloud and position them in front of Marlos in the hope of blocking him from leaving the poison cloud. The other summons will just wait in front of the poison cloud and kill any sisters that survive the poison cloud and move out of it. Which unfortunately some of them do. I actually could have easily prevented that by simply casting Poison Cloud on top of everyone again on the start of my turn. But I unfortunately didn't realize that. So here we are. But at least my other summons have something to do now. For the remaining fight we simply move the Poison Cloud on top of Malos whenever he walks out of it and hit him with Ray of Sickness until he is dead. Last but not least, we have to face Gang of Torm. Against her, we go invisible and start the fight using only our summons. You can stay invisible with your character forever by simply entering turn-based mode once you started the combat. This way, we won't lose any of your conditions since you are in turn-based mode. And since the combat also already started, it will keep going ignoring the fact that you intentionally pause the game with your main character. We then simply use our summons to bait all the flying squads together around them so we can hit them all at once with fireball. Hitting this massive AoE attack allows us to kill all the flying squads in almost one turn and therefore significantly reducing Gang Ghost's HP. Unfortunately we only got her down to 200 HP from killing the flying squads because not all of them joined the fight. But that's alright. It's still low enough for us to kill her now. For the rest of the fight we simply use our summons, mainly the newly summoned Asia, to tank her attack for us, while we stay in the corner spamming Ray of Sickness until she's dead. The only thing you have to look out for at this point are her coin bombs, so none of your summons accidentally die from one of these. Now. Perhaps you'll find peace. With all the Shadow Storms dead, it's now finally time for us to head to the Tor Mausoleum. There we solve a puzzle which opens a hidden door that leads us to the Gauntlet of Shah, hidden beneath the Tor Mausoleum. Inside the Gauntlet we meet Balsadar, Cadaric's chief advisor and the next person on our kill list. Luckily for us, Shah has sent some of their undead justiciars to assist us. And this is also the reason why I picked Nock as one of my spells at level 8. Once the combat started, we can use Nock on the door to Balthazar's chamber, which then forces him to join the fight. But we won't fight on his side, at least not really. On our second turn, we attack Balthazar to turn him hostile. 
This is Soli, so we get his XP once he dies. And he will die. Even though it might not look like it at first, with no one to destroy the Umbra Tremors, he will sooner or later be overrun by the Justicias. And while this happens, we simply hide inside the room where we came from and basically just wait. We are still going to help Balsata a bit by attacking the Justicias out of our room, taking a few of them out. Unfortunately, I got a bit unlucky in the end, missing multiple attacks on a one-hit Justicia in front of me. Because of this, I was forced to use a speed potion and a poison cloud to safely kill the remaining Justicias. I know, it's a massive failure on my side, using resources to kill a boss. Unsinkable. After this massive fight, we are going to enter the vault inside the gauntlet. Once more, using Nock to open the door. Inside this vault is the last item we want to acquire from the second act. The Kalos Glow Ring. This ring lets us deal an additional 2 radiant damage against enemies that are illuminated. With Balthazar out of the way, we explore the rest of the gauntlet. Deeper inside the gauntlet, we complete Char's trials to acquire the 4 Umbral gems that we need to get to the deepest level of the gauntlet. Unfortunately, one of the gems is guarded by the Orton Yugia, so to his misfortune, we have to kill him. To be able to get close to him unnoticed, we turn invisible. Additionally, we cast haste on ourselves and drink a flying potion. After we position ourselves behind him, we use our summons to initiate the fight. Our main character will stay invisible until Yugia finishes his turn to avoid any risk of dying. Just don't forget to enter turn-based mode again after you initiated the fight to avoid losing any of your buffs. After Yugia finished his turn, we use our movement line to exactly find out where he is standing. Once we've done that, we use his own bombs to blow him up. Since we can just move his bumps around, we just put all of them right in front of him. And after we set everything up, our heroic Azir will sacrifice himself and blow them all up. After this explosion, Yugia has about half health left, which is just enough for us to finish him with two blight spells. As for the remaining fight, we mainly just use our flying potion to play a hit and run game with the mech ones. This lets us stay outside of the danger the mech ones could provide and we can take them all out from a safe distance. Having acquired all 4 umbral gems, we can now move down to the deepest level of the gauntlet and then enter the shadowfell. But before we enter the shadowfell, there are still two fights at the surface that I want to do before that. Starting with the easy one of these two, we are going to introduce the Gehyanki to our little friend, Minor Illusion, followed up by Poison Cloud. The Poison Cloud is exceptionally effective against the Gehyanki, this case because it removes their light source which protects them from the Shadow Curse. They now take two instances of damage whenever their turn starts, which leads to them all dying rather quickly. Back at last light in, we are finally going to save Isobel. At least for now. For Isobel's fight, for the first time, we are going to use the skeletons as our undead servants instead of the zombies. And this is because I don't want to use them to deal damage, but instead to heal Isobel. This might sound a bit weird at first, but don't worry, it will all make sense in just a moment. Before we start the fight, we drink a potion of vigilance to guarantee our first move against markers and a speed potion because we are going to need the extra attack if we want to save Isobel. Once the fight started, we drink an elixir of battle mage's power to increase our spell safe DC and then hit him with two level 4 way of sickness spells to hopefully poison him and therefore reducing his hit chance. The reason why we didn't use the elixir of battle mage's power as one of our pre-buffs 
is because this would have overwritten our elixir of vigilance, causing us to lose our guaranteed first move against Marcos. But now after the combat started, this elixir doesn't do anything for us anymore, so we can replace it. Before we are going to end our turn, we take some of our healing potions and put them on the ground, on a spot that won't cause our enemies to accidentally break them. And this is how I'm going to heal Isabel using only my skeletons. As I've shown you before against Yogia, you can move objects around without spending any action points. So whenever Isabel takes any damage, I can just move one of the healing potions right next to her and then just shoot it which will cause it to break, healing the character standing closest to it. This still doesn't guarantee that we will save Isabel, since she still can easily die to the winged horrors if she gets paralyzed. But it's the best I can come up with at this point without some respect shenanigans. In the end it works out for us, she survives and we can enter the Shadowfell. Don't forget, safety first before you take any lifts in honor mode. Inside the Shadowfell, we meet Nightsong, or rather Dame Aelin, and Asima, who is the source of Cadarick's immortality. And since she agreed joining our fight against him, we freed her from her shackles and led her shards towards Moonrise Towers. Before we are going to Moonrise Towers ourselves though, we need to come clear with ourselves and embrace who we are. And as you know, to be at peace with yourself, you always need to make a sacrifice. Trust me, this is the only way. We have no choice. After our necessary sacrifice, we are rewarded with our final level up for this act. At level 9, we take Cloud Kill, so we don't need to rely on scrolls anymore to use this spell. And for our second spell, we take Melv's Asset Arrow. This is going to be our spell that we use to take out Merkel. It's not the best spell for such a task, but I want to stay inside the necromancy team. And I think Mav's asset arrow still fits into that theme. At least more than the other choices. Since we are now level 9, we also unlock our first level 5 spell slot, which now allows us to summon ghouls with our animate dead spell. There we have two choices, the flying ghoul and the normal ghoul. They are both very similar, they both deal the same amount of damage and have the chance to paralyze a target with their main claw attack. They also both have the devourer ability, which allows them to heal themselves by biting a living creature that lies on the ground. The only difference between these two is that the normal ghoul has a bit more HP, 5 to be exact, and he also has a higher armor class, but 17 compared to the 14 from the flying ghoul. So on paper it looks like the normal ghoul is a lot better than the flying ghoul. But there I disagree, since the flying ghoul, as it's already stated in his name, can fly. And I find that to be a lot more useful than a bit more survivability, since flying allows you to take control over the battlefield, be it by taking out low HP enemy rangers in the backline, or by simply blocking certain key enemies at any given moment. Oh, and before I forget it, our butler came back to us with another gift. This beautiful creature here. The Slayer. Am I not magnificent? I told you, sacrificing people has always proven itself to be the best course of action. On the shards against Moonrise Towers, we still have all the Harpers as our allies, since we freed the Night Song before we killed Isabel. With the Harpers, this fight is pretty straightforward and with little risk as long as you stay behind your meat shields. So pretty much all I did this entire fight was to cast Cloud Kill on the first turn and then just move it once it's my turn again. As for my summons, I sent them into the enemy backline to kill their ranged units, mainly focusing on the adepts since they can kill a lot of your meat shields very quickly, or at least get them to waste their turn using their Hunger of Hades or Guardian of the Faith spells. 
the other gods don't pose any real threat, since they are unwilling to walk through the poison cloud to get to you or your allies, which leads to them just skipping their turn most of the time. Going into the first fight against Cataric, we pre-buff ourselves with a flying, speed and invisibility potion. The invisibility potion might seem a bit weird at first, since you won't start outside of combat for this particular fight, even though you are invisible, but the invisibility potion will give you advantage on your first attack against Cataric, and that's why I took this potion. After this attack, I won't use my second action point to attack him again, but instead to cast haste on Aelin, which is also the reason why I used the speed potion instead of the haste spell on myself so that I could cast haste on her once the fight started. The reason I do this is because I want her to kill Cataric for me and with the haste condition she has enough action points to kill him in one turn. And this is exactly what she is going to do, since she will always focus her attacks on Cataric if she can reach him. Once Alien took out Cataric, the next enemy he want to take out in this fight is the Necromancer, because otherwise he will just keep summoning new Necromites every turn. And that's basically the entire fight. Once you are alone against all the Necromites, you can just use the Deathstalker mantle to turn invisible after every kill, avoiding any kind of damage, or just use the Slayer. Inside the Illithid Ubilet, there isn't that much for us to do because we won't get enough XP to get to level 10 anyway. This is because I avoided any fight that involved shadows, simply because it's an absolute pain for me to take them down with this build. Yet there are still two stops I want to do before facing Merkel. First, we free us, our little friend from the Nautiloid. He then joins us as our third special shaman. And last but not least, we get the Waking Mine for the permanent Gizawai Mind Barrier condition. Before we go into the final fight, we use the Illithid Restoration and our Spellcrux Amulet to prepare all our summons without losing any spell slots. The 5 summons that we will use in the final fight are the Flying Ghouls, the Aesir, Scratch and us. I will explain each of their tasks when we get into the fight. To get all our summons into position, we group them up into two groups with a maximum of three summons per group. This is because when throwing a potion, you can hit up to three characters. I still recommend to have multiple potions ready to throw, because you are still not guaranteed to hit them all. Additionally, we drink an elixir of battle mage's power with our main character to increase our spell safety C. And with that, we are ready to walk towards Cataract and put everyone into position. Scratch will sit in front of Aelin and free her the moment the fight starts. The flying ghouls will stay here and also wait until the fight started so they can fly up to the mind flayer. It's important that you let them fly up to the mind flayer after the fight started because by using their flying ability the invisibility will break. And last but not least, the rest of our characters will position themselves on the main platform so that they can attack Cadaric. Except us. He is going to be the one who triggers the combat, using his Synaptic Discharge ability on the Mind Flayer, which also will trigger a surprise round since everyone was invisible. After all our summons did their job, we enter turn based mode again so our main character can drink her speed potion before attacking Cataric. I then use one of the two Disintegrate Scrolls I bought before from Quartermaster Tali to remove most of Cataric's HP with one attack. Now it's important that we kill Cataract in this turn so he transforms into Merkel. This is so important because Aelin only focuses her attacks on Cataract once he became the Apostle and we don't want her to waste her smite attacks on anything else but Merkel. And to achieve that we use our last summon that still didn't do anything to potentially deal a bit of extra damage against Cataract. I don't want to hear it. 36% on advantage, this was clearly just pure skill that I hit this one. 
Anyway, now that Caterwick is on 15 HP, I feel comfortable enough that I can kill him in one hit without using my last Disintegrate Squall. But before I take my shot at him, I drink an Elixir of Bloodlust so that I might gain an additional action point once I've killed him. Like last time, I used his last action point to cast haste on Aelin so she can deal more damage. For the next turn, we just focus all our firepower against Merkel. Except for our two ghouls, whose first priority is to take out the Mind Flayer. Which they unfortunately fail at, but that's alright. Because the Mind Flayer will always prefer to use his domination ability over the Mind Blast. And since he definitely will die on our next turn, he will have zero impact on this fight, even if he succeeds. Now that the Mind Flayer is dead, we can also start sending our ghouls down to fight Merkel. Just be sure to put enough space between everyone on the main platform so Merkel won't be able to hit everyone at once with his cleave attack. With our main character, we now leave the high ground so we can take out these four Necromites with Fireball to at least stop Merkel from healing for one more turn. After that, we keep hitting him with Melf's Acid Arrow and also use our last Disintegrate Squall on him. On our next turn, we again just keep spamming Melf's Acid Arrow against him. But one small and not unimportant side note we keep one of our level 3 spell slots, so we have Counter Spell at the ready, just in case if Merkel picks up Finger of Death. Luckily for us he doesn't, which also means he didn't heal, so on our next and last turn we can take back our high ground and end this once and for all. Thank you for watching and sorry again that it took me so long to get this video done. Hopefully I will publish the next video a lot quicker this time. That's all, see you in the next video. Beyond the campsite, the city waits in uneasy silence, one sleep away.